This week at the New York Auto Show, I ran into McKeel Haggerty. We talked about insuring the 840 horsepower Dodge Demon and which class of cars we should be buying now. That's today on Afterdrive. Hey, so I'm here with McKeel Haggerty from Haggerty Insurance for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of those is we're in front of the Dodge Demon. Why are we doing that, McKeel? You guys are insuring this thing in partnership with Dodge. I mean, what? Uh, how did that come about? Well, it's a little weird that the uh, talk of the New York Auto Show during Easter week is a demon. Right. Um, yeah, it's a little it's strange a little awkward, to me, but, but um, <laughs> you know, this is a really special car, and this is, uh, I, I think, in, uh, hopefully it's not the pinnacle, but it's a really representative of the fact that we're living in the second golden age of the muscle car. That's and true. And for the past several years, the you know the, the OEMs are building some of these cars that are they're cool looking. They have all this performance, and they have a huge enthusiast following. And they've yeah. done a really good job building that up with movie placements and celebrity endorsements and all this stuff. And you know you obviously had the Hellcat, which was uh, I think a surprise for everybody that yeah. was uh, you know such a success. They developed this and they were nervous about it because um, obviously it's a street legal drag car. You know, you see it here and it's doing a wheelie. Yeah, it's it's a car that does a wheelie from the dealership. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's just look at the specs. On pump gas, it's 808 horsepower, right? Yeah. Uh, do you think there's a maybe a tie-in with the uh, eighth Fast and Furious movie? Perhaps? Yeah, I think they were aiming for a number know. there. It was yeah, a maybe. car built for the numbers. I mean, it's exactly uh, 100, and, well, it's 101 more than the Hellcat, yep. so that was 707. It's about as close to a street legal drag car as anyone's ever made. I mean, outside of like those 60s, um, you know, uh, CPO, yeah. You know, cars where you just you order the biggest engine, you yep. put it in the smallest car, and that's that's what you do. Yeah, I mean, it, it's exactly in that tradition. And when I think of you know some of the drag variants of you know early Hemi cars or you know Copo Camaros and that sort of thing, is that there was a tradition of this, and this follows in that tradition. That's why it's the second golden age. Yeah. Um, so back to your question, they were asking, they were trying to figure out. I guess they were getting pretty close to production and all of this big build up to the launch, and they thought, wait a minute, what killed the muscle car? 40 years ago was insurance. Not just gasoline, it was insurance. Uh, right, the, sure. Most of the cars that were being built by Detroit that were the high horsepower versions were not insurable back in the late, well, early, really early 1970s. Yeah. And so they said, wait a minute, who insures a lot of muscle cars? Who understands this? And they actually came to us. Oh. It's been a great partnership. They've been awesome to work with. We, you know, we were part of the embargo and keeping it quiet and really fun to get there. So how do you even start thinking about insurance for a car that, you know, is a obviously a specialty car, super high horsepower, yeah. um, going to be on a racetrack probably, I mean, from an insurance perspective, how does that work? Well, it, I go back to the idea, second golden age of muscle, and yeah. it's also, if you think of all the amazing sports cars and, you know, supercars that are out there right now, they'll go 200 miles an hour and, you know, sub three second or around three seconds, zero to 60 times. Yeah. There are lots and lots of cars on the road that are super high performance these days, and that are all part of, I'm not saying part of a collection, but they're part of that collecting mentality. Even right. though this car can go very fast, even though a LaFerrari or a McLaren or a Porsche Turbo S goes very fast, the owners of them tend to treat them with a little bit more care. Sure. You know, they tend to be a little bit more diligent. It's not that the cars don't crash and there aren't going to be I issues around them. It's just that the premise is that this is going to be cared for differently. And of the 3,000 that are built for the U.S. and 300 for Canada, um, I think our chances are, are better than most that this is going to be a car that doesn't just you know, hold its value. It'll increase its value. And, you right. know, 10, 20 years from now, you, you will find these probably with a lot of them with very low miles on it because, yeah. you know, it's... Uh, it's a car you just don't want to put a lot of miles on, and now this one here has the little drag skinny front tires on it. I mean, this is a normal everyday car. It just has 800 horsepower. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, every, every nice day. little grocery getter. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, if you don't count like cars like the Koenigsegg, I mean, it's the quickest car to 60 of any production car, of you know, real yeah. production car, yeah, yeah. production line car yeah. ever, right? Yeah. There are only going to be 3,000 of them or so yeah. built. And inherently, it's a it's a collector car. It is, and it was you know kind of conceived by, designed by, built by, loved by car people. Yeah, you know car you know men and women who love these things, and it'll, that's who will buy them. Yeah. So well, to to that point, right? So um, you know we, we like to talk a lot about which cars are the new collector cars because I mean you know when we were kids, older people were collecting like Duesenbergs and yeah. and you know uh, you know early Mercedes and Jaguars and all that stuff. Um, 
What about now? So I'm looking back at a car from the 80s okay. and going, oh, that's kind of a, feels sort of modern, but it's really not. And we're going to get to the point where the idea of a modern classic is kind of outdated. Yeah, that's true. And I struggle with that term, modern classic. I'm not sure where, where do you start with that? What's modern? Yeah. And people often point to the 80s and 90s, and those aren't modern cars. I mean, those are cars that are starting to look dated, and they didn't. They had electrical systems, but not a lot of electronics, and the performance wasn't even close to what you see out of you know 2000s and, and beyond. Uh, but there were some really cool cars then. And you know, I remember I grew up in northern Michigan, but I went to college in California, and you'd see all of these. The you best know, of both. Yeah, car the worlds, best right? of both. So I saw the best of Detroit, and I saw the best of you know what was coming. A lot of it out of Japan. Japan coming to the West Coast sure. and, and obviously European cars because you know you had better dealerships and more wealthy people and now those cars kick they kicked around for a long time and suddenly they're being you know they're being sort of snapped up by younger collectors um, you know, younger collectors would love to have a Shelby GT350 or a 67 Ferrari or something like that. But a 67 Ferrari, you know, a 275 is a $3 million car. Right. Oh, I can buy, you know, all of these, you know, cars from the 80s and 90s that were, you know, cool sports cars built by, you know, manufacturers that weren't at that top tier necessarily, but that are now just high, the cars are highly sought after by yeah. the younger collector or, you know, younger just car person. And who, they don't necessarily view themselves as, collectors it's just they're enthusiasts yeah and so the cars are cool and it's changing so fast magazines haven't caught up with it auction companies haven't caught up with it dealers don't even know what to do with That's them true. and I think it's just awesome because well, it's like a new kind of revitalization of the car world. it's really amazing I mean when you see a uh, you know a, an Acura Integra R going for $50,000 yeah, exactly I mean that to me is like wow that 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 signifies a real shift absolutely in demographics yeah um, because, I mean, those were the cars that we grew up with, as, you know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. That was the important stuff. What, what other cars like that are you looking at? Well, for, especially for, you know, the next generations, I, I don't know what to call these vintage SUVs, early off-road cars, uh, trucks. Um, you know, if you think of the number of SUVs on the road today and the number of cars that or vehicles that people drive that are SUVs, the next generation are going straight after those early variants of them right. as their first car, fun car, or what enthusiast yeah. car. So, you know, obviously Land Rovers, they're kind of always in a world by themselves, but if you look at, you know, Broncos and Scouts and, uh, you know, anything of that kind of, you know, Jeep Cherokees, um, Grand Wagoneers, sure. you know, really cool. Well, and yeah. those are, they're, they're highly sought after and they're they're less expensive. Um, I, I think that in a lot of ways, the Bronco is showing a lot of characteristics of um, kind of hot rodding from the 50s, where you take an inexpensive donor car that's attractive, right. and they're restoring them in kind of common ways, but modifying them, right? right? Little, like subtle lift kits, you know, taking the back end off. I mean, all sorts of different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and, and looking at Scouts yeah. going up, I mean, that's, Scouts were, I, it were sort of everywhere for yeah. a while, and then, of course, you go, oh, wow, I haven't seen a Scout in forever, and they're really cool. And, uh, and obviously Grand Wagoneers, you know, when, when once you see somebody buying up all the old ones and restoring them and selling them restored, then you know there's definitely something happening. That's true. There's a scout running around in my town that has this faded U.S. ski team logo on the side of it. Oh. I'm coming for that one. Yes. When I can get that guy I to sell it, that, it's mine. I remember that magazine oh, we had. Yeah. Was it, what Olympics was it? Was that uh, 76? Oh, yeah, 70, uh, Lake Placid? Lake Placid, Yeah, 76 there we go, Olympics. Lake Placid, the scout. Oh, my. That's yes. going to be mine. <laughs> So, okay, what, uh, so we're talking about Japanese cars. What about, uh, you know, obviously that's peak era for Japanese cars. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, so you look at, you know, Toyotas and you look at Hondas, but, you know, you mentioned Acura. Acura's an interesting one, obviously much later entrant into the car market. And you can buy these great little manual transmission, inexpensive versions of them that no one in the traditional collector car world would have ever said, oh, that's a collector car. So what do we call it? Right. You know? in the face of autonomous driving and Uber and everything else. Like, I, I like the word like fun to drive car. I, what, what do we, what do we yeah. with hyphens, There's right? No, fun yeah, to we drive. don't have a, a vernacular for it yet. Yeah, we don't, because modern classic doesn't capture it. And yet yeah. there are enthusiasts who want them. And I don't want to be the one that says, yeah, that's not any good. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, any other ones that I might not be thinking of? Well, you know, so we've covered the like major car categories, this modern muscle, you look at Japanese cars, you look at trucks. I right. think that the more interest, a, a trend that is different, the, the younger generation's comfort level with modifying cars and not feeling like they're butchering it, but right. just feeling like, oh, well, wait a minute, I, I can put a new app on my phone. Why <laughs> can't I change the car around a little bit to make it work better? Sure. 
um, they don't view it as changing it. They view it as kind of an upgrade that's appropriate for the thing. And so it's different than the previous generation of hot rodders. And again, it's it's new. They're approaching it differently, but I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, very cool. So uh, we'll see what happens, right? At the yeah. next auction or the auction after that. The I mean, the, the, the amount of cars being, you know, changing hands and the amount of liquidity in this market yeah. is really making it kind of easy for people who would be nervous about buying a collector car before to get into it because they at least know they might be able to get out of it if they run into trouble. Oh, that's right. And you look at like, I mean, I'm shameless plug, but go to our valuation tools. We put it out there oh, for everybody. Yeah. You know, the top end of the market's kind of tapering right at the moment. The bottom end's kind of going like this, but you look at modern classics, it's a hockey stick. Wow. And you know, again, the auction companies don't even know what to do when some of these things show up because they don't know if it's going to sell for $5,000 or 50 or 100. And you know they make their money and it's selling for a hundred. Yeah. But you know they don't know what how to approach it, and that's what's going to be fun to watch. And and really we get to enjoy the ride. Yeah. Well, last question: Where would you put a 2002 Jaguar XJR 100 on your list of? <laughs> well, I think that's going to be one of those, right? That you know it was. Uh, I don't know how many were built, but I mean, uh, you know. I think it's uh, 250 came to America. Yeah, something like that. Well, those yeah. are those are those types of cars. You know, it'll be the limited edition version of something that's yeah. worth a little bit more. And you know what? I, I haven't figured out with all of those types of cars. Like, I mean, my God, Bentley makes more cars per year than they made in the previous 30. That's like, true. what will happen with those? Yeah. Who knows? Right. Um, so anyway, we're cool. in a great era to be part of the car world. Mikhail Haggerty, thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, that's after drive for today. I'm Mike Spinelli. Go to thedrive.com for more stuff. See you later.